I welcome you to turn in your Bibles with me to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, I hope you have that message outline in addition to your Bible. We are seven weeks into our series in James. We love living faith. That first section, we stand with confidence, and ultimately that confidence is rested in God's, in God's Word. We serve with compassion. We accept others. We assist others. We practice that indiscriminate love, that love your neighbor as yourself. And now in this third section of the, 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 the letter in, in James 3, we speak with care. And I think we really touched a heartstring. Uh, I heard from several of you this last week when we talked about appreciating talk's power and realizing the impact of our speech and that uncontrolled talk hurt versus controlled talk help. And that's what God calls us to. But, uh, and so do we realize the impact our speech has and our ability to communicate with each other and head toward this controlled, under controlled talk that helps and encourages others. And where we left it last time was, well, how do we do this? It seems kind of impossible. How do I manage all this? I can't quite do it on, on my own. All kinds of, and all sorts of things just come out of my mouth and, and I don't really like that. And we ended where James, I told you, James helps us. And in this section, it's really a continuation and it answers some questions about how to control our talk and speaking with care in terms of cultivating our thought and cultivating wisdom. And really, James is going to contrast two kinds of wisdom here. And changing our talk starts with changing our thoughts. And which wisdom am I internalizing that is then externalizing through my speech? Which wisdom am I taking inside me? And then that affects outside me how I communicate and talk with people. And that's the contrast James provides for us. So let's look at James 3. We're jumping in the middle of the chapter. The first part of the chapter was on that control. And now we're going to keep going. And it's really about wisdom and what we gain through wisdom, cultivating that inner thought, that the change in heart, the change in mind, change inside as we get close to God that changes what happens on the outside, including our talk, but also other behavior. And really, this chapter 3 is a lot toward teachers. You know, be careful if you're going to be a teacher. But that principle of changing what we do, teaching with their mouth, also applies to good works and how we live our life. So we capture the value of wisdom's humility. We capture the value of wisdom's humility and we value wisdom that produces good life. Look at the first part of verse 13. He who, oh, who, he asks, starts with a question, who is wise and understanding among you? So that's the question. Who's got this head knowledge, but this wisdom for life knowledge? Let them show it by their good life. So he asks the question, and, that, and then he answers it. And I like what someone said when we think about wisdom. What does that mean? Someone said it this way, the ability to view life from God's perspective. And that's wisdom. That's a nice definition. And how do we know when someone has it? Who is wise and understanding among you? Is it, is it book learning? Is it uh, degrees? Is it sophisticated speech? Maybe it's a large political following or, or lots of hits on social media. Is it having a grand reputation, or is it lots of money, or is it being famous? Is that what shows, as, shows us as wise? James answers very simply, let them show it by their good life. James says, hey, you want to know who's wise? Look at their behavior. And we value wisdom that produces good life. And I wrote that good life phrase on the outline on purpose, because sometimes when we think about good life, we think about success or influence or looks or health or or money, or stuff, or youth, or great connections, or beautiful people around us in enviable parts of the world. But how James says, no, it's the good life, the righteous living. And that's what he steers us towards, is let them show it by their good life. And then look at the end of verse 13 there, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And I put on your outline this, we value wisdom that produces good life, but we also value wisdom that fosters deeds of meekness, fosters deeds of meekness. True wisdom leads to a life of deeds that reflect wisdom's humility, good works done with gentleness, kindness, and meekness. And meekness in the Bible, and I love it, it's the strength under control, 
but strength under control of the Spirit of God Himself. And I love what one teacher said about this. The evidence of this kind of attitude is a deliberate placing of oneself under divine authority. And he says the only way to control the tongue is to place one's mind deliberately under the authority of God and to let him control it. See, it's a control issue. It's an authority issue. And meekness is the strength under control of the Spirit of Christ himself. So we, we show our wisdom by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And so we capture value of wisdom's humility, not wisdom's pride or arrogance, but wisdom's humility in the strength under control from the, of the Spirit of God. I put in, on your outlines in red just for this first verse, will I choose this kind of gentle, that's that meek, that, this gentle service through my speech, through my life, through my unheralded good works, through my gentle and meek words and actions, through yielding to the Spirit of Christ in such a way that this strong yet gentle Spirit totally pervades my speech and my actions. Am I choosing God's wisdom that leads to humble, humble, gentle, kind, meek speech and service? If you look on those outlines, and if you have one, you can see that. I put a quote there for you. Here is an original show and tell. Remember doing that when you were a kid? I loved show and tell time. And he says, here's an original show and tell. Wisdom is not measured by degrees, but by deeds. It's not a matter of, of acquiring truth in lectures, but of applying truth to life. It's not just accumulating. We can click through and kind of get all these lectures and, and we can get all this kind of info online at, at, at the push of a button. Yeah, that's not wisdom. Wisdom manifests. It's measured by how we live our life. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So we capture the value of humility's wisdom. Let's go on, starting in verse 14. We center our heart in wisdom's grace. So wisdom's humility, now wisdom's grace, and we reject envy and self-promotion. And self -promotion. On your outline, we reject envy and self-promotion. And James, again, he teaches us through a negative example. And he contrasts through describing the wrong kind of wisdom and unfortunately, you know, the one we tend to pursue, usually when we, you know, the Bible describes the wrong kind, that's the one that we tend toward. That's the one that we default to. So he says, hey, I want you to contrast these two kinds of wisdom so you really understand. So he says, and it's a very negative way of saying it, he says, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, well, don't boast about it or deny the truth. And so he says, both jealousy and ambition, you know, they put ourself first. And we tend to think, well, you know, less for them, less for you, more for me. <laughs> and this section started with an admonition, you know, in chapter 3, to be careful about being a teacher because teachers talk and, and our talk reflects what's inside us so that we're under greater accountability. The more we talk, the more that spills out. And so what he says is be careful. Don't harbor when you're teaching or when you're living life. Don't harbor bitter envy, that's jealousy, selfish ambition, ambition in your hearts, and then don't boast about it or deny the truth. Hey, be careful when you're boasting about this kind of wisdom. Don't deny the truth that it's not good for us. Envy and self-promotion have no place in godly Christian life. Instead of saying, hey, look at me, humility says, let me look to you, your needs, your desires, and your good. But we struggle. And James describes this false wisdom. He's contrasting wisdom from heaven, godly wisdom, and wisdom from the world. And so he says, hey, this kind of wisdom, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, so verse 15, such wisdom, and it's kind of in quotes, you know, quotes weren't in the original, but it captures the intent of what he's doing there in English. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. And he's very abrupt there. It's of the earth. It's worldly. It's unspiritual. 
and it's demonic, it's worldly, it's not godly. And in fact, he says demonic, he says it's satanic. It's really in op opposition to God. So we reject envy and self-promotion, and we want to gain God, you know, wisdom's grace, and we also refuse opposition to God. When we adopt this worldly wisdom that is focused on jealousy, that is focused on ambition, God says, that's not from me, that's not from heaven. In fact, it's demonic, it's unspiritual, and it's worldly. As one writer says it, it consists only of what is natural, excluding the supernatural influence of God's Spirit. So left to ourself, naturally, we tend toward bitter envy and selfish ambition. And James says, whoa, that's horrible for us. It's totally missing out on what God wants for us. And if we're called away from you know, selfish ambition and, and bitter envy, we're called toward, what's the opposite of that? This generous grace, right? But if we stay in this envy realm, this ambition realm, this worldly realm, this satanic realm, this demonic realm, he says, for where you have, look at verse 16, where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. And so we reject envy and self-promotion. We refuse opposition to God. But we, and we also recognize this kind of false wisdom leads to confusion and it leads to sin. And he's painting this image of if we follow worldly wisdom and instead of wisdom's grace, we have disorder, we have conflict, we have a sinful lifestyle, we have argument winning. I just got to get ahead of the other person. We, we're, we're contrastive and we're destructive teachers. And worldly, then, it becomes its only natural. And you think of like talk shows and blogs and opinion articles and the political process and reality shows. They're all based on conflict and domination and often greed. And James says, as followers of Christ, we're to adopt instead a gracious lifestyle. The opposite of envy and ambition, which is pushing us away from, right? And turning us away from. The opposite of that is a gracious, giving spirit that approaches others, others with kindness, gracious speech, and a gentle spirit, putting others' welfare before our own. Isn't that beautiful, see? So we center our heart in, in, in wisdoms, not just humility, but now also wisdoms, grace. Will I choose gentle service? And will I choose gracious giving? Yeah, they're, they're really tied together. Will I choose gracious giving. Well, James goes on, so we center our heart in wisdom's grace, and we also choose the pursuit of wisdom's peace. And we pursue heavenly purity. Remember he said, okay, here's what the worldly kind looks like. It's unspiritual, it's demonic. But now we can pursue heavenly purity to multiply heavenly virtues. And so this is where it changes us, the wisdom that we gain that starts on the inside and then that comes out and affects how we talk on the outside and what we do on the outside. So we pursue heavenly purity to multiply heaven's virtues. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, see the contrast there? The wisdom from the earth, right? That doesn't come down from heaven, meaning it's down here with us. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, that's from God, is first of all pure. Then, and encompassing that purity, then it's peace-loving, it's considerate, it's submissive, it's full of mercy and good fruit, it's impartial, and it's sincere. So this heavenly wisdom, that's wisdom, folks, that's sourced in God's character. As we get close to God, we gain heavenly wisdom. As we get close to God's goodness, remember, we, we, gain, we gain his goodness. We've seen that before in James. And, and James says, you want this wisdom from heaven, it's pure, it's unmixed. And what he's saying is it's free of those things I just described, envy and selfish ambition and disorder and every evil practice. Hey, that has no place. So it's pure. Notice he says it's peace-loving. And peace is like the absence of conflict. Don't we want that right now? And it's just not there. But peace-loving desires an atmosphere of peace that promotes happiness and well-being. He says this from heaven is not just peace-loving, it's considerate. Folks, this is the word gentle. And I don't usually share exegetical definitions, but this one is helpful. 
merciful or tolerant of slight deviations from moral or legal rectitude. Merciful or tolerant of slight deviations from moral or legal rectitude. Gentleness overlooks less than perfect behavior in the lives of others. You know, Jesus says, hey, uh, you know, don't be so concerned about the splinter and think about the log in our own eye. And so this wisdom from above, that's from God, from heaven, is peace-loving, it's considerate, and it says submissive, and this is, this is this willingness to yield to meet the need of others. You know, like Jesus said, Father, not my will but yours, and then he goes to the cross for us. It's this willingness to yield, not to gain, not to get ahead, to meet the need of someone else. It's this being accommodating to meet the needs of others. Wisdom from heaven is full of mercy. That's this active sympathy. It's not just a feeling of sympathy. Oh, I feel bad about that. But it is actively uh, working toward sympathy in action and good works that actually make a difference. And so full of mercy and good fruit, we understand that when we see it all over the Bible, godly deeds that make a difference in life and in the life of others. It's also impartial, and that's a little harder, right? It's, this, it's, it's a love that doesn't cause divisions or strife. It's one that seeks unity. We talked earlier a few weeks back about indiscriminate love and loving our neighbor as ourself. But impartial purity is one that says, you know what, I'm not trying to cause strife. I'm not trying to cause divisions. I want to seek unity in following Christ together. It's sincere. It's without hypocrisy. That's what sincerity is. It's not two-faced. There's no pretending, right? That's the idea here. So we choose the pursuit of wisdom's peace, and we pursue this heavenly purity to multiply heavenly virtues. Verse 18, I love this one. It wraps it all up. We plant peace to grow right living. Verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. I like what someone said. People committed to preserving peace must teach the word of God peacefully to reap a harvest of righteousness. That good fruit will not come if teachers sow it in words and ways that inflame and antagonize people. See, we're called to be peacemakers. And we sow, right? You know, like you sow a seed, right? Not so like putting cloth together, but we sow a seed and we do that. We sow in peace to reap a harvest of righteousness. And, and as he's talking about our words and teachers here, what applies to teachers applies to all of us. Is my speech, are my actions flavored with the language in service of heaven? Folks, if we sow in conflict, if we're antagonistic, if we, we seek to inflame and we seek to jab and to push and to cut and divide, if we sow in conflict, we reap division and strife. What James says, if we sow in peace, our harvest is a life of righteous living that impacts the life of others in gentle, gracious, and peaceful ways. See, bottom line, will I choose peacemaking? Will I choose peacemaking? I put that quote there on your message outlines. I'll read it for you in case you don't have it. What we are is what we live. And what we live is what we sow. What we sow determines what we reap. If we live in God's wisdom, we sow righteousness and peace, and we reap God's blessing. That's what, that's what James is teaching us. Will I choose gentle service? with my tongue, with my speech, and with my life? Will I choose gracious giving with my mouth and with what I do? And will I choose peacemaking? Will you pray with me, please? Father, this is convicting. Will we be peacemakers? Will we choose gentle service? Will we choose gracious giving? God, you want to change us. Help us to pursue the peace that comes from you. And that changes us on the inside. And then that reflects in our behavior, in our life, in our words, in our deeds. And the wisdom from you is seen in our purity, in our generosity, in our mercy, in our consideration for others, in our accommodating to meet the needs of others. We want to be compassionate like you are. 
as we get close to your goodness and it comes down from heaven to us, may it show out in activity that includes our speech and our life service. God, help us to harvest all this in an atmosphere. Help us to sow it in peace. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.